It's very sure. drop, folks. Yeah, dropping. So um, we'll get underway. Um, in case you missed an announcement earlier, um, the list hiking session in, um, in session probably just now has been cancelled. Was well, unfortunately. Um, but we do have uh, Robert with us. Um, so we'll get underway just in a minute or two, and we can take a wee bit more time to discuss at the end. Yeah. Uh, I'm giving out some iron brew sweets. Never had iron brew. What would you call it? Scottish delicacy. <laughs> Should you take that? No, no, no. It's not bad. It's not a bad thing. It's just a, it's like a drink. It's a soft drink. I've got to make it. But it's, it's funny that that. Hello. Um, but it's, it's a distinctly kind of Scottish thing. Yeah. 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 Find anyone who can 
So some of the ways that OER can do that are things like lowering the cost of education, increasing the provision of one form of learning opportunities, extending education to groups that don't have the same level of access, uh, supporting diversity and inclusion, and you know, more generally you can talk to things I guess from different barriers to things barriers to collaboration between different stakeholder types and big leaders of institutions. I'm so glad I'm going to be repeating the information to the companies. We do sometimes see the same sort of ads in different places. One thing that's interesting about the European picture, as opposed to, say, North America, is there's a great deal of linguistic and cultural diversity by comparison in the same sort of area. And so, some of these things that is part of the expression of why they're mixed by organization. Um, you know, things don't necessarily translate that well. So, um, just a word around kind of innovation as a concept relating to OER. In a separate strand of work to the one I'm talking about today, myself and some colleagues at the Open University have been doing a, a big mixture review and um, looking for drivers, barriers, challenges, and enablers, all relating to uh, innovation to OER. And what you find if you go and sort of look systematically through the literature is there's an ambiguity. Way that people talk about OER innovation. So, a lot of the time, people just talk about OER as the innovation. So, this is number one of these two definitions. And so, people will say, hey, OER is an innovation, innovative behavior. And it's true in the sense that compared to traditional approaches, traditional pedagogy, starting to use OER, even if you're doing nothing differently, right, except you've got openly licensed resources that are proprietary resources. That's the innovation. Okay, fair enough, that's true. But there's also a different sense of OER innovation, which in a way is the one that's a bit more interesting, which is how people use OER to support sort of downstream innovation behavior. Those two things are conflated completely. You're trying to find literature. And so people will tag it to keyword and say innovation. Just they're just using OER, which if you're familiar with OER, it's like, okay. Not that mind blowing, right? You're using OER. But if you're not familiar with OER at all, that is an innovation. So sometimes it's, it's useful to be aware of that sort of slight ambiguity um, with innovation. Uh, so some of the areas where you might find innovation happening, I mean, I would say it's kind of a unique thing. <coughs> it's not really the resources themselves, and it's just something you have a small innovation, like innovation one. Um, and so, some of these things are to do with portability, to do with training rather than teaching. Um, and these are sort of areas that are going to find quite a section. And we are maybe you know, that is in ways that people are currently in their current practices. Um, and this is, you know, if you're familiar with kind of brand strategic objectives, if you're familiar with the UNESCO declaration, it's, um, there's a lot of interest in the ways that OER can support these bigger societal changes, but it's actually quite hard to find concrete examples. When you step outside of the OER communities, quite hard to find people using OER and doing things with it, consciously moving in that direction. So anyway, one of the things that we're trying to do below, uh, we're doing an encore, it's kind of uh, threefold. So one thing is we're trying to Come up with a <laughs> systematic way to understand how evaluate, how innovation works with OER and it's evaluated. So this is really about getting the concepts right. Think about innovation. It's a 
my name is Super. It's wonderful. So, this is innovation. It's, it's often a value judgment, right? But you say this is an innovative practice, or this is a kind of, you know, uh, a significant new change, or something like that. You can also do, you can also be necessarily the best innovations that become the most popular, right? You can have to remember the HS and the Max, for instance. The Max is a superior program, the HS was the one that we made. Um, so it's complex, it's not an easy way to evaluate this. So probably one that I talk about is the sort of conception work that's been done to try and sort of create some categories that can understand this kind of stuff. So coming off the back of that, we've been developing the framework for evaluating these use of OER with respect to innovation. So what I'm going to do is so I'm going to take you through these two things together by showing you some of the bits of the framework and uh, talking a bit about the concepts behind that. The third sort of part of this is the difference of uh, research using those concepts, using those questions. We have some case studies that I know talk about some of the patterns that are emerging from that. So it's kind of three things for the price of one in terms of intensity. Um, I'm going to spend a bit of time on, on the slides for you. This is amazing. Um, basically, um, using just a future of innovation, which may be free. Task artifacts and the SAMR framework. Conceptualizing innovation itself. Talking about OER itself, how people use OER, obviously that's massively diverse. Use of the SAMR framework, I'll talk about more about that in a second. Um, but when it comes to um, thinking about you know, most of the resources that, that are available to sort of theorizing around this stuff come from business studies, and they're normally framed in the language of competition. So innovation, what's the point of innovation? It's the thing that lets you beat your competitors because you're one step ahead of them. You've got the slightly better technology, the slightly better practice. And, you know, so a lot of the language of the resources of innovation come from that kind of sector. So one underlying question here is, is that the right thing to be talking about when we often want to emphasize with open is the more collaborative aspects rather than, you know, we're all fighting against each other, which is kind of, you know, sort of classic business studies. Um, also got a business model typology for a bit, which I'll share with you in a second. This is really synthesized with the existing ones that are in mind. sort of quick rationalizing to reduce their categories. A little bit of work that has been done is around stakeholder models and, um, I hope you ever tried to find a generally yet simple stakeholder model. There aren't that many, right, where it's just like a universal thing for stakeholders. Um, and so the one that we've been using here is called sometimes the UPC, and it stands for uh, Users, Providers, Influencers, Governments, or Customers, uh, Providers, Influencers, Governments. Um, and it's a slightly obscure, but it's the one that I found most useful. Um, I'll talk more about these things as we go through. So, uh, I'll take you through some of the aspects of the framework now. And the only way is to slightly possible to make possibility themselves and then compare with all the case study that we'll put together in the same module. So, I'm asking you for basic stuff. Um, what are you doing? What's your use base? Are you focused on this and this? Since micro is institutional level, meso is regional level. Macro is national, international. So I was able to start by thinking about who's your audience, who's your customer base, who are you trying to connect with? What you see is the key challenges, and what do you really want? Um, and then the next section is uh, based around a classic thing from business studies, which is Miles and Snow, 1978, with respect And if you're not familiar with small fans, which uh, myself, Dr. Martin Murphy, I guess it was about five years ago. Um, it was also based on this idea of uh, one and so here, So, here, it's really a set of binaries to say to people on their day. Here's what you're offering as you're making a local service. Something that is, you know, the cause of the people. It's for education, it's in the whole critique of the main problem. Or are you offering something alternative that sits alongside that, or is there as we can't stand? And so each of these binaries, which is highly important, which is highly important, 
traditional practice of the traditional way of doing it. For example, the client doing something is different and it's comfortable. So we're going to use the traditional model and so on. So for each of these hard people that I have in the fashion years, it's not a matter of fashion. Here you can see the categories of computer sports, like objects and environments. And so this, this condenses a lot of different ideas into a small thing. But so far, I've been able to, I haven't found anything that challenges it. So everything fits in some way. If you know something that doesn't fit in here, that'd be good. I'll just tell you quickly what these things are. So externally funded, you might get money from philanthropy. You might get a grant from the Hewlett Foundation, for instance. You might get money from the government. Um, or you might basically uh, offer a route to advertising to your learners. And so commercially, money is coming from outside. But it's not that you're not necessarily selling the data, it's more like the Facebook model. And you're sort of offering a route in to advertising. Internally funded, you might get money from your institution. You might be given the choice to say, well, if you save money somewhere else, yeah, you can have some money to spend on OER. Why not? Um, and there's also the author pays model. It's not popular. Right? You should basically pay for it yourself. Um, but a lot of the time, this, you know, no one would really say, yeah, we're doing this. But if you think about it in time rather than money, loads of people do this. Um, you can contrast these with more sort of community-based approaches where the stakeholders kind of own the platform or own the infrastructure. Uh, maybe they pay a membership fee. <laughs> That's what keeps it going. Um, and then you have what we call service models. I mean, some of these are kind of like MOOCs and that kind of thing, or um, you might have something freemium. This is like OpenLearn, but you offer some content for free. People like it, they want to carry on, and then you start charging them. Um, uh, and you offer various services, or you offer a way for, you know, you sell the data that you collect in your VLE, for instance. Um, so these are different ways of thinking about um, business models. If I was a skeptic, which I am, and a pedant, which I am, I might say these are actually revenue models. They're not all true business models because they're not concerned with costs. They're only concerned with where these companies coming from. Probably the right thing to say, which I think is the closest to what you're doing. Um, in practice, people often they combine them as well, right? That was a bit too complicated to take out this. So you just ask people which is the closest. But you know, you can combine them. Uh, we also ask about what kind of pedagogy you we uh, do have a big list of technologies that it brings this so far. I also offer people examples of pedagogies as well. So I'll say, you know, is it closest to this or closest to that? Uh, a lot of it's basically benchmarking. So I mentioned the SAMR framework. It's really hard to find a, a really concise way to talk about all the different ways that people use OER. are. But I'm finding this to be a fairly useful one. Um, so, the SAMR framework is um, a model of technology acceptance. Um, so basically, any educational technology that people use in the classroom can understand it going through these steps. So we say to people, are you basically substituting OER for commercial content? You could be doing that, but with a few tweaks, with a few changes. You could have a significant redesign of what you're doing based on the fact you're using OER. Or you can completely reconceive how you're using, uh, how you're teaching, for instance. And if you think about something like open textbooks, you know, at one level, yeah, you can just do a straight swap. You can have stuff where there's some stuff online to support it, or you can maybe do a little bit of tweaking or remixing. You could have that taken to another level. But then you can start thinking, why are we using textbooks at all, right? It can be a route into reconceiving how you're doing it. So, um, so it does map quite nicely onto lots of different ways that you could be. Um, stakeholder group. So I'm kind of getting all the pieces on the board so I can then talk about it and I'm just giving you the information. Uh, so this is the way that we've been uh, developing our stakeholder model in Onboard. The UPIC model, so users, these are the people who use OER. Providers provide OER. Influencers kind of affect the discourse around OER and kind of what people actually end up doing. And then governance basically set the rules and regulations around you know, institutional use or non institutional use of that data. Gradually, we've been actually finding this year what we've found is really valuable. It's incredible. But we do say, like, if people are using the framework themselves, 
you don't have to use these categories, you could build your own stakeholder listing and use that instead. But it's just a thing. So then, what's the all these different stakeholder categories, what is your value proposition to them? And what is the impact it's having? And I guess implying, are they matching up? Like, are you really delivering the thing that you say you can offer people that they are? Um, and similarly, um, so this is the future of innovations stuff that I mentioned before. You can say, okay, all these different groups, what are you really offering them? Where is the point where you say, this is why it's relevant to you? So these are the, the five categories that in Rogers are used to sort of explain why some innovations get you know, adopted, others don't. So thinking about the chess and use it's not necessarily the best thing to say, but more sensitive about your position. And so I'm not supposed to about that. Um, there are a big list of barriers and enablers that people even think can say, you know, sort of identify their own pattern. So these are just the categories that it fits into. But you can imagine it's quite a broad range of things that it can be. Um, and the last bit is just for saying, okay, I have to all that stuff. It's time to do some of that. Um, but also, when people you know, imagine, so in the case of these, I'll give you some examples. 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 So that's the sort of rough outline of what the framework is going to involve. I'll say a bit about the case studies. Uh, so these will be the same on this part of the page. Uh, so first of all, thank you to those who took the time to give us the data. That was pretty essential. And it's like you're always in the fun of doing these audit surveys. Uh, we research them since four nights or nine months. And then check out the spray. So we made this several different continents. So we've got a spread of organizations where some were you know, just providing to a few dozen people, maybe in a classroom, up to uh, millions of users every month in different repositories. So here you can see some of the Right, where you can see there's a mix of different things, different size organizations, some EU projects, some local things. Um, America's represented. Um, and yeah, basically, some of the other stuff is the So, on to, oh, sorry, we must take a picture. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so what's coming out of the survey? Some of this stuff I think is genuinely is quite interesting and unbiased. Um, so, to give you a sense of what's in the data set, so we asked people, what kind of, how would you describe your operation? Are you more like a project? Are you more like an institution, and so on? But one, one business only. Um, projects and initiatives are kind of time bound, right? They're not ongoing forever. They have a, an end date. Um, most of the people who said other were basically not for profit. Um, and so they weren't sure where they fit in. And you can see here, like, international is the most common focus for the people that answered. But we did have a pretty good spread across the others as well. Um, and looking at how long they've been going for, you can see, like, for the internationally focused people, about half of them would be going for more than five years, which is you know, significant. I wouldn't, wouldn't expect that necessarily. Um, but then yeah, quite a bit spread across the different, you know, um, time periods that people could have been going for. So um, this is where you get getting into the more interesting stuff. So we asked people, which is your main kind of OER implementation? This is the SAMR categories. And we also asked them, what's your business model? Which is it closest to? And so what you can see is for substitution, it's much more common to be in an institutional context. So you're already, you're already using the textbook and then you're moving to the open version. It's the kind of classic example of this um, But then as you move down into more kind of what you might say is more innovative use of OER, you also see more diverse business models emerging as well. And um, for people who thought that really what we're doing is kind of redefining the way that we teach people, 
you're seeing some, you know, some much more sort of quirky examples of uh, how they see their sustainability work in the future as well. And um, uh, you can sort of understand this as a kind of progression in a way. This is the temptation, right? As people become more experimental in their pedagogy and they're using OER in kind of different ways, they're also becoming a bit more experimental with their business model. Maybe they're forced into these things, right? Rather than giving them a choice. Um, and one thing that's, I think, interesting to sort of bounce off this, if you're familiar with Darwish, from a paper from a few years ago, uh, this is a the idea of edupreneurship. And um, it's not that easy to read, it's quite a detailed table. But basically it says, you know, as you use content in different ways, your revenue models also change. And they become more complex or more kind of distributed or decentralized and these kind of things. Um, and it moves away from that, you know, uh, kind of here's some content line and more into the direction of we're connected to lots of different things, including the job marketplace. And, you know, there'll be a sort of more coherent system for the way information is shared between them and this kind of thing. Um, so this kind of gives some support to Darwish's model because what we see is as we move through the hill up, I should first of all say, I'm assuming that these can be mapped, right? So static content, interactive content, dynamic content, transformative content, I'm saying can be mapped to substitution, augmentation, modification, and definition. That's an assumption on my part, right? But if you allow for that, you get partial support for the idea that Darwish puts forward, which is that as you move into more kind of interactive content, more kind of uh, innovative ways of presenting content, you're also moving to more innovative ways of uh, understanding how your revenue basis. Because I'm asking, uh, one of the challenges that you face specifically with regard to communication. And uh, the top answer is my narrow to us being what we can say. At least, I think you could say it's time, and I can sort of say that way. Um, in my eyes, people just don't know what we're doing. That stops us from doing what we want to do. I guess it's the issue. Uh, changing culture and practice is a barrier. Um, there's a temptation here, I think. Some people might have sort of thought we were asking about in general what are your challenges or in, you know, in general what's stopping you. We did ask it in terms of innovation. These are the answers people gave. Um, there wasn't much difference between position four in terms of skills development and time pressure. So time pressure was a separate category. You can also look at this um, based on the size of the institution, so the, the, the size of the focus, so what they're trying to do, what they're trying to connect with. And again, you can see there's not that much difference based on this. It's mainly money, awareness, and pressure, changing people's culture and practices. Um, so, changing the choices of the This is the results that we got when we asked people. And so, here, the yellow is Prospecto. That's considered the more innovative approach. Whereas green, Defender, is the more traditional approach. And so these are now ranked according to which were the ones where people thought they were most respectful. Uh, and so people thought it's really about our competitive advantage. That's where we're innovating. That's where our focus is when we're trying new things. Um, secondly, the value chain. So if you like the value proposition that people are making. And then moving down, communication channels, sustainability, networks, so on. Uh, down at the bottom, the target group shows the highest proportion of sort of defender attitudes. What this means to me is they're still focusing the traditional learning, right? It's not like they're sort of trying to break into some new idea of who should be learning and who should be using OER. This is my interpretation. Um, so this is quite interesting because you're trying to compete in new ways but to hit the same audiences. So that's, you know, I think a sort of remarkable finding. Um, I should say that for sustainability, this was the one where I uh, looked like, I think probably about 12 or 13 people gave no data for sustainability. So I guess they couldn't they didn't really know if they were more of a perspective or a defender. But I think it's interesting in conjunction with the previous slide about challenges faced, where budgets and finance were the number one challenge. And so, so challenging, they didn't even know what their approach was to sustainability, maybe. Um, and so you can appreciate that 
This is just the sort of top level breakdown of this thing. When you start connecting with different variables, you get some interesting patterns emerging, but we're still in the process of putting that together. So, um, we ask people like the barriers and enablers. What's enabling you to innovate? Maybe surprising, open source software number one. And I guess it's the kind of thing that it's a little bit invisible because you don't really think about it. You know, it's like you don't really think about it. How does my computer work? Oh, how does this server run? But this is what people said. They also said leadership was um, a really important enabling factor. So it should be pointed out, people completing the survey kind of the leaders, right, of their organizations. So there may be a little bit kind of bias in there, but it's still interesting. And the idea of personal characteristics driving things. So not necessarily a strategy, but more like individual creativity, individual drive, that kind of thing. And um, evidence, yeah, important, maybe not the most important thing, and so on. Um, so yeah, you can see for yourself, there's a range of stuff here. Um, and I think the interesting thing is going to be relating these to the different patterns to the other answers to see what kind of configurations emerge. Uh, so we also said, and asked some questions about uh, people's organizational culture. This is something science and history is really going to come back. Uh, and um, when we ask people this, they would say, okay, it's a big picture, right? It's just the end. But yeah, innovation is a model. Innovation is a model. We are writing those approaches. Our staff are empowered and so on. It's a daily part of our activity to be innovative. I mean, not everyone's saying this, but this is where the highest sense of it comes. And even the lowest. So this is the lowest degree of the market. So, um, and again, these are things that in the innovation sort of literature, people recommend some of these things. Using KPIs to track innovation behaviors. Not that popular. Management system for tracking, no, don't want to do that. It's not cool, right? It's not fun to have a KPI for innovation. You want to have more of a kind of like, we're doing something cool, we're creating, we're being innovative. Um, but also, again, that idea that personal drive and personal leadership seems to be a more important factor than a system for innovation or a system for managing innovation. Um, just a couple more slides to show you again. Uh, so when you do put all this stuff together around the stakeholder group, you can get some nice combinations. So here you have the stakeholder categories across the top. So you can say to people, what's your value proposition for each of these? It's just the Frontiers of Young Minds design. What's your value proposition for each of these? What impact are you having for each of these groups? And where is your focus with regards to the sort of diffusion of innovations? How do you construe this so that somehow this, this, and this all line up nicely? So this is one of the things the framework is intending to do is to help people think about this. So we also said, um, you know, we can put together this strategy from that kind of stakeholder that we say by the general attributes of a bit of innovation. Um, so, it's, 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 um, so, I'm basically saying these are most important aspects of these five. Um, and you know, there's not a massive difference between them, right? So, uh, I think we need to do a bit more work on this again in terms of working out the granularity of it. We also ask people, are you achieving what you want to achieve? I don't think we're going to publish that in a case study. But it'll be interesting to have people who said yes or no to that question how they saw this and how they saw. You know, the impact of what they were doing. So, um, last sort of bit from the next study that I want to share is trying to find, if you like, the general value of our position. And this is based on the data from the case studies. So, four qualities. First of all, transformative, focused mostly on the MNR, the SAMR, so less on substitution and more, more radical redefinition, rethinking. What's going on? A practical in the sense targeted primarily to users and providers, less to influencers and governments. Making it observable, 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 simple, and compatible. These are all the ones that came across as the most important when constructing. Um, but also this idea that there is an ongoing interest in expanding the, the offer beyond just necessarily where you start with the users and providers. And making it more of a kind of strategic thing, expanding that to a wider audience. 
And it's just quite interesting stuff. Now, like I was saying before, like, it's quite ephemeral, it's quite hard to take the comments of the information. Uh, so I'm just very interested to try to actually try to just nail some kind of imagining things down to him. It's quite a hard thing to, to get a grip on. So, forthcoming publications and the innovation works kind of on. So, the thing that I've been talking about today, the innovation framework, this will have a kind of blank form, if you like, for people to fill in themselves, but also all of the case studies as well. So, the idea is you can, you can compare your own responses with the responses in the main data set, but also have a bit of commentary in there about the results and that kind of thing. Um, I mentioned the desk report, desk research report we're doing. Um, that's an ongoing bit of work, it's quite a complex bit of work, but we're getting there. Um, and so the idea again would be to try and have these sort of generalized understandings of what are the challenges uh, around innovation, what are the barriers, how do you overcome them? Um, and so from the case studies, we're also going to be um, doing some more developed uh, cases, and there'll be a showcase for OER innovation in Europe coming out uh, later in the project. So thank you for your attention. Um, the uh, Bonkor project does have its bits of uh, three or four events. We have been the best in synthesizing the task within the past few months. So a uh, final conference we saw in November or December. So I encourage you to check out the website. It's not on. Most important to join the network. In our online conversation, see what's happening. So it's on Bonkor project. Thank you. This is going to be the second presentation in this session. You can take whatever questions you have, and then probably still finish a bit early for lunch. And I think this this general that's had that first. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation, um, Robert. I have a question that is embedded with a commentary, and it's around the concept of innovation. Um, it's part of my research, and I was wondering how you approach to the concept of social innovation. Because sometimes innovation can be focused on technology appropriation and business models, as you said about competitivity. And this can be in tension with part of the openness and the movement of what is the education about, right? Well, for instance, our social innovations can be a little bit more nuanced in its uh, theoretical approach to education as a phenomenon as it might allow to understand innovation, not on the technological part and the appropriation part, which leads, for example, to the appropriation of some art as a framework to measure innovation, but rather towards the social aspects that enable, um, well, transformation in the structures, which is part of what openness is about. Um, in my own practice, um, I have approached, and I made a mistake as a practitioner of OER to approach innovation in the tech way through my nonprofit organization. And I know that it can be like a, an innovation that is not impactful because it's focused on content and technology rather than the social practices that underpin a long lasting change. So my question is around this tension between innovation and social innovation and you know, why have you opted for this concept right or the other one? Yeah, thanks. So, um, so um, it's a so, uh, this is a really interesting agenda, which is around um, supporting greater flexibility in the market and so on, and the transition between education and work and stuff. And it was really in response to what was being said from the pre market process to the way of business. So, um, as I said, the last was most focused on that. But the obvious is studies for us at the time, and the force of the Concepts, 
Um, the it's the dominant concept, especially if you're on the focus. It's facilitated the right to produce an outside of the human issue. So that's kind of how that's ended up. The perception of the nation itself has been raised with me before. And she's surprised at the right And she was saying, um, you know, this is a whole other element of this. But I don't make sense to think that she's not much focus on this field of work. Uh, I'd like to talk about it. This is impressive and it's going to change a lot of things. Um, I love it. Um, do you have a special uh, piece of work associated with this for which you, you don't only evaluate and describe what's happening with the landscape of OER, but also you actually provide a framework for those institutional organizations who want to take all of their own route? Because I see there is. Um, you know, it's very important. It's very important to understand the landscape. Then you have to provide something for those who want to start doing things. How many of these elements are reversible into a framework for decision making, institutional decision making? And the other question is open source in general. About this. It, about this, about repository. So, um, so here we are. And there are some people there, basically, they're basically startups, right? And they don't really know, just trying to understand what's going on. They don't have a really good sort of recipe for companies. Can't understand where's the money coming in. So I think that's really a part. Part is just as bad. Position of the LTP, the worst thing that can be sustained. But also it's kind of, you know, thinking in terms about, okay, so what happens next? If, you know, if I want to make money by, But uh, OER, innovative OER, so that's the, the, the OER, the type one was the adoption, <laughs> type two was the use OER as a, as a driver or as a tool for other innovations. And you, uh, uh, isn't that that the, uh, that the second one is actually contributing to the adoption of OER? Yeah, quite possibly. It's really just something that I sort of noted when we're doing the literature review. Because you're searching for papers where the keyword is innovation and OER. But you're getting a lot of stuff where it's just, we, you know, we're a college in North America and we adopted OER, and that's, that's an innovation thing for us. And it's like, I'm not, just, not disagreeing with it, but it's different to the kind of, we're using OER and it's really transforming the way that we're approaching things. And so it's just trying to sort of separate out those two things. Um, but I think it's an important thing to be aware of. 
for anyone who goes off and starts Googling OER innovation, you might just get stuff where it's like, we've adopted OER. Yeah, but and maybe the focus for the OER community uh, to, to widen the adoption of OER should be more on this second uh, yeah, I mean, conversation. Then, then. I think it's the more interesting one, actually. Yeah, but um, also appealing to, for instance, decision makers. And for yeah, instance, when you say yeah, OER can contribute to the to the question of flexibilization of education for yeah, that, yeah. that's that's on the mind of OER. Yeah, and it's it's a little bit of a shame that the desk research was happening in parallel with the survey. So it wasn't that we had good all the concepts worked out first. But I think you're right in the sense that for the substitution, people with an interest in the substitution and augmentation, maybe they are more interested in innovation one. But the people who are, you know, more interested in, you know, policy makers and that kind of thing, maybe number two is the more interesting prospect. So yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, thank you. I think um, we're getting on to 22, so I think what we'll probably do is my colleagues opportunity to um, each side now. You're allowed to escape, yeah. Um, but thank you, Rob. Uh, one last time, it's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, yes. um, there's a long break now until uh, two in the next session. Join the lunch. <laughs>